Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, if you haven't met me before, my name is Haruka Radabush. I'm the Senior Programs Manager at the Japanese Cultural and Community Center of Northern California, uh, based in San Francisco's Japantown. And I'm very happy to welcome you all here to today's program, uh, which is a book launch for the new uh, book of poetry uh, titled Seas uh, by Brian Kome Dempster. And so uh, today's program, we have Brian with us and he will be presenting uh, some of his poems and uh, also some um, accompanying photographs and uh, video clips as well. So uh, definitely looking forward to that. A little bit about Brian. Uh, Brian is a uh, professor at University of San Francisco uh, in the Department of um, Letters and Rhetoric, as well as the Asian Pacific American Studies Department. So uh, welcome, Brian. Um, at this point, uh, I'm going to hand over the, the rest of the program to you. So please take it away. OK, Haruka, thank you so much. And <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to sort of transition and pivot towards the presentation and give everyone a little bit of context. So what, what's gonna happen is, and I'm sure many of you have been to Zoom presentations of all kinds this year. This particular one, I thought you as the audience would find it most compelling to make it multifaceted. So what we've done, we're gonna have a PowerPoint and the idea of the PowerPoint is that it's gonna resonate with the poetry reading that I do simultaneously. So you'll see me in a box and you'll see the PowerPoint in another box. And the presentation itself is gonna go, you know, around 30 minutes or so, give or take. And then we're gonna leave about 10 or 15 minutes after that for Q&A. And we'll warn you in advance when we're transitioning to that. And you can have your cameras on or off at that point. And then, I'll say some closing words after the Q&A. So the whole event will probably be around an hour or so. And anyway, I just wanted to give you a preview. And then what I'll be doing is it'll be interspersed between the poems will be some context, some explanation, some background, and everything hopefully relevant to the book itself and your understanding of some of the poems which are set in the context of a 48 poem book. And I'm gonna read you know, a small sampling of that today. So without further ado, Haruka, if you could put up the PowerPoint or maybe it's already up and I don't see it. I just wanna make sure. Okay, there we go. Okay, so <clears throat> everyone should be able to see in the screen now, hopefully, and I'm going to close this box. Okay, so there's a box with me, but there's the PowerPoint. And this is the cover page. So I just wanted to get us all kind of located here and really give you a big warm welcome and thanks just for being here at this event. It's been such a challenging and unparalleled year. And with all my heart, it means everything that you've taken an hour of your day to be here with me. I'm very honored. And that's just our opening. So let's uh, go to the next slide. And what we're going to do is from here on out, I told Haruka that we're going to do a little, and, and that's a little bell from the Buddhist ceremony honoring my grandfather. And that'll be the slide transition marker is the little ringing of the bell. So in terms of acknowledgments, well, there's many people to thank for today's event. Of course, the Japanese Cultural and Community Center of Northern California, JCCCNC, I really feel warmly connected to them because I used to teach an internment autobiography writing workshop there. And I worked with Japanese Americans that are former camp prisoners. The center, as it's called, is a very vibrant place in the heart of Japantown. They do so much good for the community and so much good for Japanese Americans and others. And in particular, I want to give thanks to Jennifer Hamamoto. And actually, I've been practicing Haruka Raudebush. And I hope I got that right. And Haruka, in particular, has been really helpful in putting together the PowerPoint and running this program today. And Jen 
really behind the scenes, helping with publicity and marketing. So thanks you two so much. Of course, my publisher, Four Way Books, Martha Rhodes, my fabulous editor, Sally Ball, Ryan Murphy, Clarissa Long, and Bridget Bell. I know some of you out there are with Four Way and during the pandemic, they've been exceptional and they've always been exceptional at any time. Really, really honored to be with them. All the event co-sponsors, JSAY and then USF has really stepped up, Asian Studies, Asian Pacific American Studies, the Masters in Asia Pacific Studies program, the Center for Asia Pacific Studies, and my home department, Rhetoric and Language, to all the directors and program assistants and student assistants that helped publicize and get the word out and support me. You have my heartfelt thanks. Um, what Haruka has put there is just, a, you know, if you're interested in get a copy of the book, we do encourage you to buy it directly through Four Way Books because indie publishers need our help right now. And during the pandemic, they've been hit hard, but they've been valiant and really risen to the challenge. And as I said, Four Way deserves our support. So it'd be great if you can order through them, if that feels right for you. All right, so we now transition into our presentation and this first slide, if you look at the book's cover, I want you just to take a few moments and let it sink in. And as you let it sink in, I just want you to imagine, what do you see when you look at that painting? What does it evoke for you? And as you think about that for yourself, I'll tell you a little bit about it. So this painting is by my mother, Renko. Her artist's name is Sui Ren. And when we were going through all her paintings, you know, we went through a bunch of them. And I asked her, what do you think would be the best one for this book? And we settled on this. And for me, I don't know about for you, the audience, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about this in the Q&A, but for me, it evoked the colors of the brain. There's gray, there's black there's white, there's red. It also evokes the impact of an epileptic seizure, which is a big theme of the book and my son's condition. And then there's this interpretive scope of the painting that when you look at it, you can see so many things in it. For me, I see a brain, I see a heart, a face, a field, blood and fire. And I think there's many more motifs and themes that you as the audience may see. Those are all things present in the poetry itself. Ryan Murphy at Four Way Books, one of the associate directors is just such a talented gifted designer. And what he did with the actual, you know, title for me was quite powerful. The letters kind of allied into the painting itself. If you look closely, you can see the white block letters, they're sort of blurred. And I thought that was a really smart idea of him in terms of getting this concept of, of seizure, elision, juxtaposition, and you know the ways in which things synthesize in the book. So a big shout out to Ryan for his talent. He just does incredible covers for Four Way. I'll do the bell. So what I'm gonna to do today is in this poems, I'm actually gonna read them in the order that they appear in the manuscript. And as I read them, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you the page number that they appear in the book itself, because I know that some audience members and readers like to have the book in front of them and reading the poem as they hear it, or maybe doing that for part of the time. I leave that up to you, but this is the opening poem of the entire book. It's called Night Sky, and it's on page three. And this picture is of Brendan and I, we think he's about one years old. And it, it almost makes me tear up to look at this picture. But anyway, this is on the steps of our cabin in Kenwood. And he's on my lap, as you can see, Incidentally, our cabin Kenwood burned down very recently, and it was so 
sad on my father's side of the family, a cabin that's been in the family for generations. And so I wanted to include this photo of that meaningful rustic space that we go to get away. And this is my sort of first moments of, of being a father with Brendan. By the way, as I read these poems, Haruka may switch slides sometimes and you'll see some of the text of the poems in the slide. Obviously the images that I chose are meant to go with the poems. Okay, this is called Night Sky. At his birth, I held my son against stars, charted the climb, his flag among stars. A jagged pulse shook our space, his mind a blizzard of stars. I keep it quiet how he sees earth crooked, his words buried stars. The next photo, I wanted you all to see Brendan when he was younger. and <laughs> I hope it gives you a laugh. It really makes me smile to see my incredible boy here. He is in his stroller slash wheelchair and he grew up with fluctuating mobility. He has epilepsy, cerebral palsy, and he's nonverbal. And his chair serves as a place of comfort a place of safety, especially during those times when he'd have drop seizures and fall. And so he's really happy in his chair, right? Um, he's wearing a red harness there and the harness has a handle on the back. And what it allowed us to do is that when he was walking, we would grab the back of the harness to make sure he wouldn't fall down. And so, you know, he's in his, his sort of safety apparatuses, if that's a plural of apparatus. Anyway, I thought the glasses tilted were just such a cool touch. And Brianna, one of our fabulous caregivers had taken this picture. It's just always stayed with me. Okay. So in the book, there's the father-son journey, the speaker trying to understand, come to terms with having a son with special needs. And of course, the poetic speaker and the material is autobiographical, but also fictionalized and drawn from imagination. So there are elements of memoir. And then there's also this idea that me, Brian Comey Dempster, and the poetic speaker are not the exact same person. But of course, this book is very much based on our lives together, me and Brendan. Along with that, we also have history being woven in. So I want you all to see the Nichiren Buddhist Church of America. Now, Dean Rader, my friend who's here today, and some of you others, I know John Nelson, a Buddhist scholar is here today. And so, you know, th this is my family church, meaning the church of my grandfather, Ojichan, founded in, I believe, 1931 called the Nichiren Buddhist Church of America, 2016 Pine Street, only about four or five blocks away from the JCCNC. My uncle Kazu, who's here today, he grew up in this church with my mother and their brothers and sisters and my grandparents. And this is a more modern day picture. I was a caretaker there for many years and lived there for over a decade. And it's from around that time that we took this picture. I wanted you all to see my grandfather, Kazu's and my mother's father. I called him Ojichan growing up, which is basically like grandfather in Japanese, but this is him in his priest's outfit. And I believe this was taken right in front of the church. It looks like it was. And I think that smile he has, 
and that upright posture is very indicative of who he was, man of integrity, strength, a leader in the community, and one whose congregation deeply respected him. He was married to my grandmother, who I called Obachan growing up, and that's Japanese for grandmother. This is her in some traditional Japanese attire. She herself was a very accomplished poet. And I do have some poems that talk about her writing. She helped keep the family together. She was like the glue. And she herself did some Japanese traditional ceremonies and arts and music. So she was very multi-talented as well. And my grandfather is a master calligrapher, so I just wanted you to get a snapshot of him doing calligraphy in the church. I think that's our church basement. And there he is with his sash across. So you see the convergence of his priest duties and his artistic practice there. Those are all entrees into the next poem I'm going to read, which juxtaposes my mother's experience as a about a one-year-old when she was unjustly forcibly removed from her church home along with her family a little bit after my grandfather had already been taken away from the church home in 1941 and 1942 the japanese american wartime incarceration which many of you are familiar with so i started to think in the book about this notion of historical seizure and then Brendan's medical physical seizing. And this poem just organically arose from that convergence of thought. So what I have here, I thought it'd be interesting to look at an EEG readout and barbed wire and think about, as you look at that, how those converge in terms of the imagery and how the chaotic idea of the brain being out of control and the thorns of the barbed wire actually have some resonance with one another. The poem itself, those are just some quotes that I thought went with the actual, you know, um, imagery. So this poem is called Seized, S-E-I-Z-E-D, Seized. By day, by night, in handcuffs, through mind scramble, brain surged, Shock of force, body taut, alerted, taken, outside, inside, anytime, any place, no words to explain. My infant mother, 1942, my young son now. The rug, his twisted body, his world inside, and what it does. Red flare or white lightning, Fried impulse or smoldering heat. A searing of gray or glitter of stars veiled by fog. Her fragments, yellow orb, the porch light, shimmer against her face. The cradle, her mother's arms. A blanket's false cover. Itch of wool, hives on skin. Things just happen by bus, by train, in war, electric storms, a horse stable, desert, sand swirl and mind gust, thought sparks, word cloudings, mountains spike against white, a guard's boot, trodden syllable, a thorned cage, wing pierced, baby hawk and wire, my barbed string of words, to capture him, capture her. If he never speaks, I carry him. If she cries for her father, grandmother carries her. Someplace, my mother carries what is unremembered, begins to know when I ask. I don't speak of things I can't know, of despair about my son. We never know where we are going, where love 
will end us. The next poem that I'll read follows seized in the book itself. It's on page 17 of the book. And I thought it would be important to bring in some other voices besides the father speaker. And I thought my mother's voice was an important one for this particular manuscript. In this poem called My Mother at One, I attempt to reckon with the experience that she went through that she can barely remember and for her in her own voice to give us back the fragments of the camp experience. This is a picture of the panoramic view of Topaz, Utah. So you can imagine desolate barracks in the middle of a desert and, you know, in terms of health and conditions and schooling, it was very subpar. My mother at one. I am the baby erased from every war story. The wish empty in father's hands. Our cord torn by razor wire, skies of violet plasma. I sense boredom in mosquitoes, the itch beneath skin. Fall asleep to the rake of topaz wind desert willows bending over the stone tablet of earth. Nighttime, my body curled, slashed by the quarter moon, waves of heat and waiting, my lips on a bottle's nib, sand in the face, mother stooped over stairs, always rocking me. Part of the challenge of this manuscript was finding the language to describe my son and also coming to terms with what was his language. As a poet, I rely on the language that we all share but what happens when you understand language like my son, you have high receptive intelligence, but you can't express that through language. And for you as a poet, there's this deep responsibility. I, I feel, you know, in terms of this book that I really wanted to make Brendan proud, right? I really wanted to honor him. And I also wanted to be really candid and honest about my own flaws and shortcomings but also about being able to overcome them and how Brendan taught me and guided me towards that path. This poem, Brendan Lexicon then is for you out there who are poets. And I have a lot of people, colleagues from the university here and all of us deal with language. So this is my homage to Brendan. It's called Brendan Lexicon. Angel, lion, bird, cluster seizures. He splashes, barks in baths, screams near edges of pools, loves the school bus, hates grace cutting his fingernails, loves and hates most things on some spectrum. Shrieking angel, palsied lion, intractable bird, falls in cracks between labels. My son, nine years old, ma, hi, duh, his own language, a tonic drops intermittent. He chases robins, flings our clothes, against chairs, pounds, tennis balls, Claws, tabletops for dishes, tosses spoons, thumps his feet to funk beats, dunks orange ball, body checks the plastic hoop. Focal motor misfires, disco bird, point guard lion, wrecking angel. We clap for simple things, guide him back when he misses the toilet, 
piss staining his pants. Sit too close, he moves away. Sit far away, he moves close. His sounds fly by, he lets out a sad roar through grinding teeth. Staring spells, clonic, shaking. Night through skylights, our peaceful time. Grace and I on opposite couches, flipping channels, back stiff, pulsing temples, sleeping through madmen, true blood, waking to melted coffee ice cream. It's not that simple to love him so much, to hate just some of it. So we move ahead in the book to page 73. And I wanted to include, I thought it was important to not just show you today that I'm attempting to weave together Brendan's journey, my journey with him with Japanese American history, but with other histories, with other experiences. And I believe with pressing issues that today have become even more urgent. In this case, Fruitvale Station, I'm going to show you a video clip in a moment, but the movie with Michael B. Jordan, Sexiest Man Alive in People Magazine recently voted, but an incredible actor. And this was his breakthrough movie, I think it was in 2013. And it's based on the Oscar Grant incident which this poem is also based upon. And let's uh, go to the video. So as before we start the video, I just want to say that in the slide before, I wanted to show Brendan and I juxtaposed to Oscar Grant with his daughter and this idea of parent-child relationships tying together poetry, but at the same time, knowing that there are distinctions and that these are not equivalent experiences, but that they are resonating. We're gonna watch a short video clip to give us some context about Oscar Grant, and then I'll read the poem. Now at noon, the mother of a man shot and killed by BART police is speaking out about newly released documents into the deadly incident. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michelle Griego. I'm Kenny Choi. Those newly released documents are providing some new insight into the deadly shooting of Oscar Grant at the Fruitvale BART station more than a decade ago. KPIX 5's Jackie Ward spoke to Grant's mother today. They knew from the beginning, but yet still tried to cover it up. Ten years after her son's death, Wanda Johnson, Oscar Grant's mother, says this new report reveals what she has known for a decade, that her son didn't have to be murdered. On New Year's Day in 2009, BART police officer Johannes Meserly shot 22-year-old Oscar Grant in the back, later saying he thought he grabbed his taser. According to a crime report from a law firm commissioned by BART, investigators didn't buy his explanation. They say enhanced video showed Meserly reaching for the gun several times and looking at the weapon as he finally drew it. It makes me frustrated because if you look at that, the officer already had seven, you know, complaints against him that year and nothing was done. And it just goes back to the frustration level of there is no accountability for police officers. The report also criticizes a second BART officer, Anthony Peroni, saying he was aggressive throughout the encounter, using the N-word, punching and kneeing Grant as he was forced down onto the platform. BART released a statement saying in part, quote, since the tragedy, BART and its police department have worked diligently to ensure that our officers receive the proper training, support, and oversight necessary to respond appropriately and effectively to challenging situations. Jackie Ward, KPIX 5. And Meserly served two years in prison for involuntary manslaughter. Peroni was fired but not charged criminally. Thank you, Haruka. So... I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read the Grant poem. And I know Haruka's putting it back, thank you. 
this is just a picture of Oscar Grant. And it's, to me, an iconic picture. I've seen this picture many, many times in many different contexts. And to me, it's a humanizing picture of him with his daughter. The poem that I wrote in, in the book, it's on page 73. It's after the movie Fruitvale Station. And when I watched that movie with Michael B. Jordan, it really, really upset me. And it inspired me to write this poem. And the poem is short. It spells Grant down the left and Grant down the right, double acrostic for you poets out there. Capture. Go back through holes of light, gold bullets, your daughter laughing, racing you down alleyways to the car. Sun spun in her hair, atone for weed, cheating. Wipe roads skinned dark, slice rope from acacia. Night sticks whipping air, then landing. Gather voices, one refrain, three words, let me go. Rise before the shot. This is a picture of Brendan in a hospital gown at Marin General. And we spent many evenings unexpected going to the ER during certain periods of his life. And this is Brendan after being treated and his seizures have calmed. And this picture just crushes me, you know, the nightgown and his, his pose, how peaceful and calm he looks. And his bravery has always been what got us through those nights and those days. This poem broken is really about the triangle of us, meaning me, my partner, Grace, and him, Brendan. I also wanna give a shout out to our dog, Bo, rescue dog. She made us into a square, but we've only had her for two years. When I wrote this poem, we were still a triangle. And it's called Broken. I'll just read it. The park below gives us fire orange leaves crackling over green. I gulped coffee as I drove. Grace held the cold cloth on his head. I do, I do, he babbled his mantra. Our mouths chalked, minds chipped and torn away. He never gets better, I said. Her lips tighten. That doesn't help us. Back to our corners. Another night in ER. Two bags of fluids through our eight-year-old son. A flock sweeps over, shadows the flame, spiking mercury, the night cracked into ice chips. His skin paling, seizing, stopped. Some couples like us end up broken, Grace says, rubs my back. Not us, I tell her, my hand on his chest as he sleeps. Through the window, I see kids swinging into the sky, goals rising, wings white as Brendan's shirt, the silk of Grace's gown the long field flickering. She leans against me, our forms resting with his in glass. A whole life of, I do, I do. There's my lovely wife, Grace, my lovely son, Brendan, and he's in his chair, but now he's bigger. You remember the slide from before when he had the harness? Well, he outgrew that. 
And now he's in a bigger stroller wheelchair. It's in the back of our van, which has been converted and it straps down onto the wheels. And there's a seatbelt that goes across that he always takes off, <laughs> but it's called a conversion. You have a ramp that takes it up and down. And he's physically capable of getting in and out of like our Subaru front seat, but he's completely petrified and terrified to get into our Odyssey van. And so we had to get this conversion. It was necessary and it saved our lives and our bodies literally. So this uh, picture, my heart, my heart right there. Okay. So this is moving into the final part of the reading and I'm gonna read some poems from the last section of the book. And Golden Oak is of course dedicated to my brother, Lauren, a cellist, my father, Stuart, a renowned trombonist. Um, they are both very talented musicians. And this, I believe, is at my brother, Lauren's wedding. And I thought it was such a perfect picture for this poem. The two of them side by side playing their instruments. This poem that I wrote, Golden Oak, gold is the trombone, oak is the cello. And it's about how the language of music speaks to my son, Brendan. Golden Oak. The deaf hear music like gold coins in their stomachs. My boy is an oak, receives the wind of our conversation, catches scattered leaves of our words. My father's brass, my brother's string, makes sense to him. Gold comes out clear from the slide. Laughter folds inside the bell's rim. Ducks fly out, wonk and quack in air. A sound forest. Oak hums bright, then deep. The bow smooths out the noise in his head. Brown eyes lit from inside my gilded sapling. This next poem is very short. It's a haiku, 575, I believe. Well, it might be more like a variation. You can count the syllables and see if I got it right. Hi, what is that? Hi in Japanese means yes. Hi in English is hello. Hi is a sound that comes out of Brendan's mouth over and over even now throughout his whole life. Hi, 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 hi. So I always wondered, what is he saying? What does that sound mean? And this short poem is my attempt to imagine what that sound means. And this is a picture of him sailing in the bay. We had to kind of you know, roll him into the boat carefully, but he loves sailing in the bay and that's him. Hi. Look, a bird, mountain, the sky so long, blue is where you go to the sun. So the final two poems are near the end of the book. This next one is on page 125, if you wanna follow along. Here's my mother, Renko, who, as you know, is the artist of the book cover painting. She is the one who's incarcerated as a child in Topaz. And this is her, her spirit is radiant. She is an inspiration all the time for me. And this picture breaks my heart and, and it's so beautiful. Um, this is in my mother's voice. It's called My Mother Watches Horses with Brendan. Through the fence, you look out, their hooves breaking new earth. Sleek fur, the shade of bourbon. 
kicking up clods of green. I wheel you closer to shaken ground. Grandson, at 10 years old, you point at them. Once I thought you said the word horse. Someday I'll paint you the story. Topaz rain galloped over roofs, barracks thundered. We were the ones corralled. My hands on your shoulders, your hand taps my wrist. Look, they are flying over crests of hills, running into the sky. Go far enough, speak what you can. There's love in silence. All things, they come and go. Okay, so, um, before I read the last poem, I wanted you to see how much better Brendan's been doing the last three or four years. He, I'm not sure what happened, but around the time when the Warriors were doing so well and they're in their championship run sometime in that period, there's this one time he got incredibly sick. And oddly enough, when, when he would get sick and get a fever and, and vomit and it sometimes reset him and his mobility got so much better after those incidents like food poisoning or flu or whatever the case was. But this time when it happened, it, it, it seemed to be a permanent reset in that he's walked quite well for about four years now. He still has seizures. He still has some fluctuations, especially when he's tired. But for the most part, he can walk, which means freedom for him and for us. And so here he is during the pandemic walking around our neighborhood. It's a short video, Brendan walking. See how his mask, he always brings it off his mouth. We keep putting it back and he keeps doing that. We're working on it, okay. So the final poem of today is on page 132. It's called Brendan's I Am. And I'll just explain the slides because they're gonna happen as the poem goes. But the first slide is a real flood that happened in February of 2019. And his birthday is in February. So this is right outside our own house and you, can, you can't even see the street. It's completely submerged. That's our driveway. And so, the poem you're about to hear, as many of the other poems today, it draws from a lot of real life stuff. And I'm not going to tell you what happens in the poem, but what happened did happen. And there is no recording, but my poem has become the recording of a miracle for us. It's called Brendan's I Am. A close flash, quick torrent. The sounding near, it happened in time. The path deepened, water reached the house. Our son 14 walked alone to his blue stroller chair. Wheels locked. We strapped him in, his body still as Buddha beneath the tree. I steadied the bull. Grace raised the spoon of broth to his lips. Her words, Brendan, we just want you to have a happy life. Silver touches his tongue. Two syllables gush 
from his mouth. Rain gathers, our eyes close, the current flows through us. His first real sentence, I am. That actually happened. He said, I am. And we were stunned into silence. It, we were like rejoicing in our living room when he said, I am. I keep trying to get him to say it again. It's going to happen. I believe it. So this video, <laughs> you know, that line, silver touches his tongue, right? It was a silver spoon when we were raising the, the broth to his lips. But my son can feed himself. All he needs is for you to put the spoon in the food and then he lifts it. One thing I want to get across about today and about my book is that I think all of us as parents can relate to expectation versus reality. And I think what happens when you have a special needs child is your idealized expectations, they get subverted, they get shattered, honestly, but when they get realigned, your gratitude and your level of happiness and joy for these mundane things is at a, a level you couldn't have imagined. So to me, watching this video of him feeding himself is a major event. It truly is. And it's something miraculous that he learned to feed himself. So if we could please play the video. So I'm going to say some closing words, a couple of minutes here, and then we're going to warn you before we transition into the Q&A and discussion portion. So, of course, this, this I told you we were a triangle and now we are four with Bo, our rescue dog. So I, I wanted to give her some props. You know, she's amazing. I don't know how well you can see this picture, but, you know, that's Brendan, Grace, Bo and I and, you know. This is, of course, a happy new year and holidays message to all of you, as hopefully we go towards a much better 2021. It's been such a challenging year on so many levels for all of us, I know. What I'd like to say in, in closing as we transition here is, first of all, really, really my big gratitude to all of you for making the time to be here and for supporting this event and this book. This book is the most vulnerable, challenging thing I've ever written, but also the most rewarding and empowering thing I've ever written. And I appreciate you understanding that and receiving that. Um, I believe that books are only alive through their readers and the audience. Creativity in itself is a gift for us writers. It brings us our own personal growth and joy. But for our book to have meaning, for it to have some form of meaning in the world, it is absolutely essential that people like you are kind enough to attend these events, to read our books, and to share our books if you feel so inclined with others. And so 
I, I do want to say that for us as writers, your word of mouth support, your sharing our books with family and friends, your reviews on Amazon or Goodreads, even if they're a sentence or two, or your sort of reviews informally to people that you think might benefit um, from parents who have special needs children to all parents that deal with challenges with their children. And I'm sure all of you are connected in some way, either directly or indirectly to someone who has a disability. And I'm sure that all of you deal with issues of race and class and gender. And, you know, Dean Rader and I are working on this interview right now and, and talking about this idea of the universal and the particular and the particular and the universal. And that's what I think the writing I admire does as that's riffing off a James Joyce quote, this idea that if we give the particular story that hopefully it connects with the universal. And so, you know, your presence is everything to me and to us. And I do want to give a shout out to indie presses like Four Way. And I'm just going to read, th there's some other amazing writers and poets at the event today. And so please support their work four-way books and other indie presses. Forgive me, this is the list that I got at 1030. So if other writers registered at 1035, you know, I'm not gonna be able to name you, but um, some, some amazing poets and writers I want you to read. Uh, Mark Conway, uh, Judy Halebsky, Forrest Hamer, Laird Harrison, Jody Hotel, Joan Houlihan, Lillian Ho Wan. Looking down the list here. Grace Lowe Prasad, John Nelson, Ramon Sender, Mariana Villanueva. And I know Amy Yuen, I know she is an artist and she was doing some writing with me in Kearney Street. If I didn't mention your name, it's only because that was the list that I had, you know, but please support these writers and these poets. They are inspirations to me. And it's an honor that they're here today. And finally, to wrap up, I really want to thank all my USF colleagues on this list and graduate students from MAPS, uh, people from the rhetoric and language, uh, Asia, Pacific, Asia Pacific American Studies, uh, family members, like I said, Uncle Kaz and Sachi, uh, Laird and Susan Jane Harrison are here. Again, I'm trying to, to catch, catch everyone here, but, but thank you so much for being here. And so what we're going to do now is, this is a warning that I understand Zoom can be, you know, a, a bit overwhelming. So if you choose to have your camera off, that's totally cool. If you want to have it on, we'd love to be able to see your face, but that's your choice. And you should keep your microphone muted during this next portion, um, unless you're speaking. And I guess I'll let, you know, Haruka kind of say some words too, but the idea of this next 10 or 15 minutes would just be some informal Q and A, just a conversation with you guys. Um, any questions you want to ask, things you want to say, I welcome speaking with you. And then, you know, after that, we'll be able to sort of rejoice together for a few moments before we end the event. So I haven't looked at the chat for a while. So Haruka, do you want to say anything before you actually fl flip it into the other mode here? Uh, sure. I just wanted to uh, thank you again, Brian. That was amazing to, to listen to and um, really, really, you know, it seemed mirac miraculous, you know, how you described uh, how Brendan's um, condition improved. So um, it's very touching to see. Uh, for folks that uh, do have questions for Brian, uh, what we're going to do in this part of the webinar is uh, switch you guys over to being panelists. So it'll take me a little bit, uh, maybe a couple of minutes to switch everyone over so that you do have the option to speak into your mics. Uh, if you'd like to ask your questions. So uh, what we're going to do as well is go through the Q&A box or the chat box uh, where um, if you have a question, 
uh, please go ahead and, and enter your question there, um, which will kind of put you in the queue uh, for asking the questions. And then um, once uh, you're prompted uh, with your question, uh, we'll turn your microphone on so that you can um, uh, ask Brian the question directly in the webinar. Um, but for now, um, why don't we see, um, I'm gonna start uh, moving people over um, or switching on your chat capabilities. So uh, if you have questions for Brian, uh, go ahead and enter them into the chat uh, and then Brian can um, start there. Yeah, and as you guys are coming onto the screen, I just, I was kind of trying to skim through the chat here. Um, if you ordered the book through the JCCNC link or any other link that was in the publicity and you saw University of Chicago, that is correct. That the University of Chicago is the okay. distributor. What was I... this, this thing? Yeah. That's funny. Is, are you looking for me? I think I think someone's mic might be on. Sorry, it's me. Should I turn it off? <laughs> um, yes, uh, please mute yourself if uh, you're not asking the question. Okay, sorry, I didn't. I, I got interrupted. That's oh, fine. no problem. No problem at all. Um, so, yeah, I, I just had seen in the chat that someone had ordered the book and said it was University of Chicago. That's correct. The University of Chicago is the distributor for Four Way Books, and so that would be the correct link. And yeah, so that's totally cool. And I do believe that Grace Prasad, Grace Low Prasad just dropped in how to order it through four way, or at least the, the book page. And I know that Haruka will probably near the end of the thing, he'll he'll drop in the chat the um, ordering information too for you guys. And you know that that's again. Ordering it through University of Chicago slash four way is great because it supports four way directly. And that's what we'd love to do. And that would just really be amazing if you could do that. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna, I see a lot of people out here. I mean, in front of me, I see Tammy, Alexios, I'm pronouncing that right, Andrea. Carmen, who I said hi to earlier, Cynthia, there's Dean, Emily, Eugenie, okay. Jen, Evelyn. Okay, so I, I can almost see everyone now. Um, Haruko, what's the best way to do this in terms of, I mean, I can look in the chat. Uh, yeah, actually it looks like we have our first question. Um, so Tammy uh, Suzuki, uh, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask okay. Brian your question. Sorry, I think my I'm using old school computer from probably 98 or something. I don't know. Anyway, I had to buy a, a <laughs> an accessory camera and it looks like it might not be hooked up. So sorry. I got my other computer on my contact tracing work. So I'm actually doing that too. Right now. Oh. I'm sorry, Brian. I missed most of your reading, but I came or your presentation. I came in at the last minute with the silver spoon and <laughs> moving. So um, I, we probably don't really know each other, but I work at SF Public Library. Maybe you know Susan Goldstein in my department. Um, so we have a large uh, collection of books for folks with disabilities, parenting, reading, you know, all kinds of areas. We have actually several departments specifically serving that group. Um, so now it's with a, an area called Bridge. Anyway, because you're a San Francisco writer, you kind of fall into my realm too, San Francisco History Center. But would you be interested in doing a similar book talk with SFPL or is this like way too much stuff? I mean, it can be down the line too. Oh, that's so sweet of you. Are you kidding? Of course, I'd, I'd, I'd be honored. I would love to. And in fact, I don't know if you work with Joan Jasper, but Joan Jasper has, oh. we've done some events and she yeah. was sort of in dialogue. So maybe could we connect through Joan Jasper? You know, I don't think Joan is probably doing the book talks now because oh, it yeah, takes, yeah. because you have to, we have to go through some like funky experience to get this going. 
<laughs> so I've been through it once with, and I, but I had hundreds of participants, which is unheard of for my programs because my programs are typically scholarly presenters. And like, I'm lucky if 20 come to our civic center setting, but on Zoom, we get everybody. I mean, it's really great. And then we also, um, sorry to take up everyone's time. We, um, we YouTube live usually, live stream it. And then we post that slightly edited version. And so, you know, it lives on and gets, you know, many more people. Okay, so you... I'll put my email in the chat. Great. I was just going to say that would be fantastic. And thank All you right. so much. That's really, really kind my of pleasure. you. And I, I do, you know, anything I can do to reach audiences that would benefit is, is my pleasure. So thank you so much. My pleasure. I'm glad that um, JCCCNC hosted this. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled and I'm, uh, I hadn't known of your family situation. and um, You seem to be handling it so graciously. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's a journey. It's a process. But thank you. But thank you. So Haruka, if you could please save the chat, um, if, if there's a way to do that so we can. Yeah, we'll, we'll I mean, get you a transcript of it after. Mm -hmm. OK, beautiful. Wow, it's so cool to see all these faces. Hey, Johnny, Johnny, what is up? Johnny's an emeritus professor at USF. She has some of her own books you should check out. And there's, my, Joan is Hulahan just to the left of me. Oh my God, look at Dean Rader. He's out of control as usual. <laughs> Dean Rader plays the trombone, by the way. <laughs> I was thinking of that when I was reading that poem. There's my co-director, Genevieve Leung with Maps, Noriko. Tika's got his cool headphones on. There's Ramon, my, my uh, longtime family friend, and Cause and Sach, my uh, great aunt and uncle out in Milipedis. I, I, you know, some of you I may not have met personally. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just the people that are on screen. I'm, uh, there's probably a whole second page. Are there other questions, Haruka? Can you tell me? Um, not in the chat at this point, but uh, if folks do have questions, go ahead and uh, enter them in and we'll uh, switch over to you for uh, you to ask the question directly over the mic. Uh, sorry, can I go? And oh, go ahead, yes. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, I'm Tika, uh, Tika from uh, uh, USF, Brian's colleague from the Department of Rhetoric and Language. Uh, it, it was amazing. Thank you, Brian for this gracious presentation, really enjoyed it. Um, just one small comment. Mostly when we talk about like poets, writers, uh, generally when we is, you know, quarrel with others, what we do generally is we produce project rants generally, right? But when we quarrel with ourselves, that's what one of the poets, I forgot who this is, uh, told very beautifully. When poets quarrel with themselves, they write beautiful poetry. <laughs> and I, I see uh, most of the time that you, you definitely had to quarrel with yourself, having to talk about your son, your family, uh, how much of a uh, struggle it was in the creative process, because I know it's not very easy to be able to very eloquently and so succinctly express your thoughts and emotions. Uh, it's so powerful, of course, the kind of manifestation you have uh, done in this collection is so, so amazing. I can really um, relate to that, having undergone similar experiences um, in, in, in my life as well, having to raise uh, my, my daughter. Mm, in, the, in the beginning, of course, so many things uh, happened to be very relating and touching to me as well. Oh. Uh, I don't want to go in detail, of course, but I do have similar experiences. And I can understand how much of struggle, how much of quarreling it was within yourself uh, to be able to very openly express those feelings and emotions, which of course would not be that easy. I can easily understand. Mm -hmm. And sometimes um, I also write poetry, of course. I have not been able to kind of uh, talk about that a lot, but uh, I've been writing poetry in both Nepali and English uh, for a long time. And I can feel that, the kind of emotion, the kind of expressions, the kind of challenges, the difficulties, the struggles. Mm. And how, how much of a challenge it was for you to uh, um, bring up such a kind of beautiful expression. Mm. What, a, what a 
beautiful question. Um, I love that word quarrel, a quarrel with the self, right? A negotiation of the self. I think that's the key right there. I think that honestly, I've been doing some interviews over the last couple months that have forced me to confront those types of questions you're asking. And the way I'd answer it is that I, I initially wrote the poems not to publish a book. I didn't know it was a book. I was in pain. I, I was feeling a lot of trauma and I was processing. I was literally just processing. And so it was very raw and the poetry, you know, it was like kind of, to be honest, um, it wasn't ready to be published. It was very raw and fragmented and a, a bit emotional and that was fine, right? But I think, you know, what I realized is that um, to process or to quarrel means to show the full picture. And so that meant I had to admit my shame. I had to admit my fault. I had to admit my guilt. I had to admit that I somehow was to blame for what happened to my son. And I wasn't ready as a parent prepared for any of it. Um, I thought my son was going to be quote unquote typical and normal. So of course, that, that kind of dissonance between the expectations and the reality is what created the quarrel, right? Because then I became embarrassed and I, I became silent. I, I didn't want to share with others. And then when others spoke of their own children and they were normative, I felt a bit uncomfortable and that was my own fault, right? That being said, the, um, I wanted to escape the quarrel. I, I didn't want to stay in that place. And so that's why I read those later poems today to show you that, that entering the quarrel is, is, is being vulnerable, but to stay in the quarrel is a choice and that's a disempowering choice. So the empowering choice is how do I resolve the negotiation? And that's through, that's through a sort of a hard earned acceptance of reality and then also uh, understanding of that your son is an incredible human being um, and not in relationship to normative standards of children or to typical expectation, but towards his own sense of beingness or spirit or presence. And so that's why I showed you the videos of him feeding himself, of him walking. That brings me incredible joy that I never would have felt had I had a typical child. And that is no critique of, of typical children at all. Um, resolving the quarrel means I feel no competition or judgment. I just accept Brendan on his own standards and sort of through his own reality. Does that in some way help Tika? I mean, Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Exactly. That's the kind of struggle I, I face when I write myself. And the way you are talking about the difference between expectations and reality, the kind of expectations we have by looking at other normative children, uh, as opposed to what you are uh, facing in your day to day life. Uh, that is that is such a kind of pain and you have been able to articulate that pain in the in the form of this beautiful poetry and that is amazing and that's the that's the way i was looking at it thank you so much brian yeah i, I just want to quickly say though that the, the pain you honor it you feel it you go deep into it but you don't stay in it i think it's important that that poetry or creativity or art or whatever your vehicle is allows you to transmute that experience right and so i'd love to see your poems tika I, I'd, I'd love to see those poems definitely we can share sometime thank you brian okay thank you mm -hmm. i think uh joan joan Hulahan. i i i don't know what she has in store joan you oh, want to poor joan <laughs> I know. Have, uh... well, well i mean it, it really is aligned with the previous question. My question was about what Martha calls managing your material. She always uses that phrase, how do you manage your material? <clears throat> and your material is so charged and personal, uh, almost explosive at times. It, it's kind of wondrous to me that you're able to manage it and to keep it in 
kind of intact because there's the art and then there's the experience. And a lot of poets veer away from uh, really personal experience, especially now. Um, and, and I think that's a, a big loss for poetry actually. Uh, and I think it's more, much more of a challenge and a more satisfying experience for the reader uh, to get that other dimension, to get someone who's willing to risk that, to go there into that personal realm and make art from it. And so I'm really, um, I admire what you've done. I am really, I'm so impressed with your work, Brian, you know that. And I, um, I actually use an example from one of your poems in Topaz when I teach um, about using complication in poetry. And you, you just touched on that with earlier what you were talking about bringing in the idea of the narrators implicating yourself in the poem, not mm -hmm. just describing in a distanced way or in an emotional way, but also including yourself as part of it. And I think that poem, um, I don't remember the name of it, but the, the shower scene poem uh, uh, in Topaz, I, I use that often as an example of how a poem can deepen and become complicated uh, using personal experience. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I just want to, to tell you I admire what you're doing. And I love this book, I have it, and congratulations. Okay, well, I need a moment here. Okay, Joan, you're making me choke up. I'm, I'm <laughs> you're making me choke up. I mean, I was There's very that... teary during this presentation. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, Joan Houlihan is, uh, I mentioned, I don't know if you all heard this, but she's the director of this amazing conference called Coleraine. And Dean Rader has also been to this conference, but um, you know, I have to say, I to some degree, I owe poets and mentors and and guides like Joan. They gave me the courage to keep going on the charge material, and mm -hmm. that's really important. I think uh, if you're going to write about this type of thing, is to have um, and also my writing group. A lot of you are here today. Uh, encouraging me um because because there's a lot of trepidation and anxiety go, mm -hmm. going that deep yeah. um joan is talking about this kind of the confessional mode of poetry that you know in some ways became passe or or became a bit um dismissed by some and but but i do see a renaissance i see a renaissance yeah. of the personal um a revival honestly which is exciting to me mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but yeah. all i can say joan is thank you you know the book took 14 years and so i hope that 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 is uh, allowed the time. Yeah. There were so many revisions of so many poems in the manuscript, and I hope that allowed the yeah. emotional and the emotional and aesthetic to find the balance. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, thank you, and Haruka, I, I better let you do. You know, um, sure. I'm doing it off what I see in front of me. Yeah. Um, so it looks like we have a question from Ken Yoshioka. Uh, Ken, if you want to uh, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask Brian your question, go ahead. Hey, Brian. It was, hey. A, it was really great. You know, uh, two things, you know, one is, you know, the poem with, you know, kind of merging, you know, Brendan's mind and your mom's imprisonment in Topaz. Did you, have you been to Topaz, actually walked that, that walked around that place, the location? Because the imagery is so vivid. It's as if you were there because I went there on one of my vacations and I can envision which, you know, in your words, I can envision that place. So that's how I was kind of wondering. Hmm. Yeah. So, you know, Ken, I have, I have not physically been to Topaz. It is a lifelong goal of mine to go there. Like I, Ironically, I think it's really because of my life with Brendan, which has made it difficult to get there. It's so difficult for me to travel to a remote place in particular. Now, my brother, the cellist that I did the poem about, Lauren, was recently there. And I worked with the former prisoners in the camps. And so, in a sense, I feel like I've been to Topaz. They've described it for me in their stories. I've seen films of it. And my brother told me about his trip. What he did is he took his cello and he stood it up in the desert and he let the wind play his cello. And he made a recording of that. It's incredible, right? That, and he said it was like the ghosts of Topaz were playing his cello. 
And I, I wrote a nonfiction essay about that. And I'm actually working on a nonfiction book about Brendan. So it brings in some of this, this other stuff. But, um, but I appreciate you saying that. And, and I am going to go. And I'd actually like to bring my mother. She hasn't been either. Um, I feel like I've been, though. Um, thank you for that, Ken. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, because I actually called my mom. She, she was at Topaz. So I called my mom. You know, looks, I asked her, which block did you live in? And do you so, know? Do you know what block she was in? Yeah, she was in block ten. Okay, Har Haruka, make sure you put that down block ten, and then I'm gonna see what block my mom was in. And I have it, it down somewhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's nothing there at the site, but yeah. in Delta, in the town in Delta, they do now have a museum. Yes. So absolutely. they just opened it just recently in the last year or so. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Shout out to Jane Beckwith who is with Topaz Museum. Y'all got to check that out. They have a great website. Thanks. And Ken, by the way, has an awesome story he wrote for a, what was it called? The 10 by 10 project with Lori Simmons and Thatcher Gallery that he wrote. So we're going to put that up on the Collecting Nisei Stories website, right, Ken? Oh, <laughs> put me on the spot there. <laughs> He's also an amazing IT guy and he helps me with so much. He's awesome. Thank you, Ken. Sure. Is there, is there a... uh, looks like we have a quick question following up uh, about your, your brother's recording of his cello uh, from Emily Lawson. Uh, Emily, hey. did you want to ask your question? Uh, okay, sorry. I'm on uh, child care duty right now, so okay. <laughs> I, I will unmute. <laughs> uh, but um, is that recording of your brother's cello in the wind available? My daughter, who is Japanese American, Filipino American plays cello too, and and really? her grandmother, yeah, her grandmother, my mother-in-law was in uh, Minidoka and Crystal City, and the great grandfather was in Tule Lake. So uh, we love your poetry. We love all of this. So we'd love to 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 see more. Thanks, Emily. Oh my God! Now Emily and I, Emily, have we not seen each other for like twenty-five years, thirty years? I it's right I, I don't know. um emily is uh just wow emily's awesome um emily you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna message you on facebook i i gotta ask my brother um i don't know if he has it formally recorded in an album yet but if it's cool i will let you know that lauren dempster my brother has a great album circle that you all should check out it's awesome i don't know if it has the cello in the wind though so uh, let me check on you for that, Emily, and, and I'll message you on Facebook, okay? Oh, I will definitely look it up. Okay. And Emily, so I, I loved your note in, in the chat, and we, we need to talk. So I look forward to talking. Yes, right. thank you. Thank you. Big hugs. <laughs> All right. Our next question is coming from uh, Marianne Villanueva. Uh-oh. Marianne, do you want to ask a question? Let's see. I, she might she's trying to unmute. You know, Mariana, she, she's a wonderful novelist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there she is. Can't quite hear. Mariana, could you maybe type into the chat or would that be okay? I mean, I, I can read it out loud for you. Okay, well. could you read it out loud for you? <laughs> uh, so Marianne asks, uh, where is the, the essay on Topaz published? Uh, she'd like to assign it to her class next quarter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the, my, my essay about the cello and the wind is unpublished. And I think you guys saw it in the writing group, Mariana. And I think you liked it, as I recall, but I haven't published it yet. Um, I, I would, I would love to. <laughs> so, I, I, I'll keep trying, though. I'll keep trying. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Okay. Let, let's let's keep going. Um, let's see. Um, I actually have a, a question of my own for you, Brian. Um, and so it's more about, um, you know, when you started uh, writing the poems in the book. Uh, did you know it was going to turn into a whole like book to to be published or? Where they're just kind of, um, you know, moments of inspiration that, you know, 
brought these poems out and then you just suddenly had amassed a, a sort of a collection on its own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would say kind of going back to Tika's question earlier, I would say originally there's a therapeutic emotional purpose to the poetry that was about self-understanding and quarreling with the self, as he said. Mm -hmm. um, but then what happened was as I went through the process, I changed and I wanted to document that in the poetry. And so then it started to amass as Brendan grew into something more literary and artistic. But I had poems from my first book, Topaz, that hadn't really fit into that manuscript that suddenly began to seem right in the second manuscript as centering around the theme of seizure. So the idea of seizure, it began as epilepsy and medical, but I started to realize physical seizure of my ancestors as Japanese Americans, um, African American seizure by racial violence. I'm hearing some feedback on something. Um, and even seizure of those like Matthew Shepard in Laramie, Wyoming. Um, I began to really riff off the idea of seizure and that's what fascinated me artistically, Haruka. So that's when it began to build its momentum into a book project. And then going to Coleraine and working with Joan was very helpful. Getting Martha's feedback at Foroya was helpful. Uh, Dean Rader and our writing group, you know, Lily and Mariana, Grace, uh, Jay De Ritz, Roy Kamada, Caroline Kim, you know, Bren Saito, you know, their their feedback in our writing group uh, kind of encouraged me along the way. Yeah. So 14 years, though. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I said, after I wrote Topaz, which took 15 years, I said, I'll never take this long to write a book again in my life. <laughs> so I, I, I managed to do it in one year less. <laughs> hey, thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we have a question uh, from Evelyn. Uh, Evelyn, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Hey, Brian. Um, I Hi. was wondering, do you ever read these poems to Brendan? Oh, you know, um, thank you. You know, there's one poem that I read to him as a sort of ritual during the sort of the closing stages of the book called Sun Sutra. And it has a kind of lullaby mantra like quality. And then right before the book was going to be published, I was having my hissy fit freak out, like just completely terrified to publish it. And that's when I read the poems to him. And I, I did. I did cry more than I ever had before during that period. It was during the pandemic, too, which wasn't very helpful, of course. And, and I felt like as I read him the poems, even the ones that quarreled the most, that he was so receptive and still and wise that wow. I thought it was going to be okay. I thought it was all going to be okay. Um, so yeah, he's pretty cool about it. I, I, I told him I was giving him a reading about him today and he was like, hi, hi. Gave me a high five, <laughs> he gave me his you know high five. So. He hasn't been screaming. It's been great. That's great. Thanks, Brian. Did I answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Thanks. <laughs> started drifting. Yeah. Thank you so much, Evelyn. That was Evelyn Ho, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, I want off camera. Not not yeah. dressed yet. Evelyn Ho, check check out her research. She does some amazing stuff on health and medicine. And um, don't you work with UCSF? Yes, I do. So, also Genevieve Liang too. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't want to brag on Genevieve too much since she's my co-director of MAPS, but uh, Genevieve, she had a Fulbright not too long ago to Taiwan, right? Um, <laughs> she smiled, okay. Okay, um, I know, I, I don't wanna, I know this is uh, now at 1230, so maybe we should wrap up fairly soon. I, I don't know how people are doing. I'm doing fine I and mean, I'm ready to roll, but <laughs> so um, I, like I, I, I guess what I'll say is this Haruka before the next question, if you, like, I will not be offended at all if you feel you need to go or, you know, like, but for those who want to stay, I, I'm, I'm, 
I'm totally glad to stay for however long people want to hang out. Um, but but I do know that we are, are at 12.30. So, um, sure, Haruka, sure. what do you think? <laughs> yeah, uh, let's let's take a couple more questions if people have them. I know that Grace Prasad, um, she says she has a comment she'd like to give. Okay. Hey, hey. Grace. Hey there. Uh, I am one of the lucky people that gets to be in this writing group with Brian. And it's just incredible. This is really a, an appreciation. So um, so I was fortunate to see uh, these many of these poems as they were being developed in various drafts and, and even like a manuscript and looking at the order of the poems. And it's just incredible. Uh, and so rewarding. And I'm so proud to see how it's come together. The book is beautiful. Um, and also just, I've known Brian for 20 years. It's, it's hard to believe in some ways, you know, it feels like we were just kids. And so <laughs> yeah. we knew each other before we both became parents. And so I've, I've been with him, you know, in some ways throughout this journey and just to see the growth, the maturity, and, and I love the topic that um, uh, your friend brought up before about the quarrel with oneself. I think that is so apt. Mm. Um, but anyway, I think um, seeing you read the poems and really with uh, combined with photographs of your family, um, it just really came together so beautifully. And I have to say my heart expanded three sizes. Um, such a beautiful book. Congratulations, everyone! Please buy the book. Oh my God! Um, wow! All I can do is give you a virtual hug, Grace. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Um, so it looks like um, we don't have any additional questions at this point. So Brian, if you have any final words that you want to uh, impart to your audience. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah. To be honest with all of you, I, I was I was nervous about this event, and I'm not. I don't get nervous about presentations, as my friends know. And what did I mean by nervous? I don't mean. I mean, I, I was sleeping and I was fine, but I was antis in, in, in anticipation because this is actually the first event I've done since the book came out that was completely solo. And where I was going to read a large portion of the book. And the PowerPoint took me, honestly, probably six or seven hours to put together. It was very challenging, but it was really a lot of fun. And I sensed in our virtual world where we're all dealing with so much and where, you know, we're in this kind of post election recovery and hope towards the new year, I had this sense that it, it would be good to step out and show you the truth and reality of my book and share that with you, even though it kind of scared me to do that. And so in closing, I, I, I just really want to say that th this event, I, I'll never forget it. And it's, it's just been so special. And it's really, for me, an incredibly meaningful way to close what's been one of the most difficult years in my own experience um, for various reasons. And um, to have your support, to have you here, um, just so many people that I know, um, I, I feel even though we're on Zoom screen, I, I do feel a real, real connection. So uh, I just, I, I send love, I send gratitude, I send wishes for all your peace and happiness in the upcoming year. I have a lot of hope. Vaccine is around the corner. Um, I, I have a real hope that we'll see each other in person sometime in 2021. And hopefully that'll be sooner rather than later. So um, I'll, I'll just end by saying that. And Haruka, is, is, is the way this is going to work is uh, people can just leave as they wish now. And is that the. Yes. Um, and I think at this point, it would be appropriate for me to also just thank everyone for coming today. 
and uh, being with us. And uh, most of all, thank you, Brian, for for sharing so much. Um, you know, this was incredible to to listen to, um, and at the same time, um, to also see your circle of support. You know, uh, that you know, despite the, the hardships that you present, that you have a wonderful group of and a community around you as well. So, um, you know, that's something that's uh, very special to see um, in the course of this event as well. But uh, in any case, yes, let's go ahead and close this out for today. But uh, on behalf of the Japanese Cultural and Community Center of Northern California, uh, please, uh, you know, stay safe, stay healthy, and we hope that we can see everyone again in person in the future. All right, thank you everyone.